Hello and welcome to the EDH RecCast. My name is Joey Schultz and I'm joined as always by my fantastic co-hosts. Up first, he doesn't play EDH, he plays EDZ. That's Elder Dragon Zoolander. It's Matt Morgan. You know, Joey, Sundays are always a little sad. It's, you know, Monday's tomorrow, but the day before Sunday is always a Saturday. <laughs> a Saturday? <laughs> Way to pull the curtain back behind the scenes on what day we're recording this episode, by the way, Mr. Morgan. I don't know what you're talking about. Today is definitely the uh, 12th of March Wember. The, the, <laughs> wow. Oh, man. You might need to take another look at that calendar. Up next, he still refers to the Elder Dragons as old whippersnappers. It's Dana Roach. I mean, speaking of looking at the calendar, I, I can't help but look and see that we're closing in on the uh, Christmas holiday season. Um, so that makes me have to ask you, Joey, what did Mrs. Claus say when Santa asked her for the weather report? I dread to hear the answer, Dana. What, what is it? It looks like rain, dear. D uh, <laughs> dang it. Dang it. That was yeah. a ninja of a dad joke. This is ridiculous. Anyway, this is the EDH RecCast. EDH Rec is the best deck building resource on the web for the commander format, compiling data from deck lists all over the internet to provide helpful recommendations for new commander decks. And here on the podcast, what we like to do is give all of that data a little more context. Matt, what is it that we're talking about in this week's episode? Well, since we've gotten so many pre-constructed decks of the past year-ish, two years, um, we're going to revisit this topic and talk about about what the best new precon deck might be. That we are. So way back in the way, like 85 episodes ago, back on episode 106, we discussed the best precons that had been designed. And that episode covered the precons from 2011 to 2019. But there have been a lot of precons in the time since. So we're going to be going over the newer precons from 2020 forward to talk about the best new precons that have come out since then. It's going to be so much fun. I'm really excited for this one. Real quick, before we get to our main topic, let's pause and thank the folks at the Command Zone for handling all of the post-production work on the podcast, making it look as spiffy as it does. And of course, we want to thank our sponsors for the show too. Uh, yeah, the EH Recast is sponsored by Card Kingdom and TCG Player, uh, Magic's own elf on the shelf compared to everyone else's Krampus. Oh my God. Uh, just go over to EDH Rec and find the card in question. Click on the vendor link down below. Doing that supports both the site and the show. And if you'd prefer to support the show directly, you can do so over at patreon.com slash EDH Retcast. We have patron tiers of all sorts of levels, and it's just a great way to support the show, but also getting a little bit of perks back for yourself, whether you want to join the Discord, you want to see some of the historical challenges stats that we've done. There's all sorts of stuff over there for you. So make sure you head over to patreon.com slash EDH Retcast. And we even actually give a very special shout out each and every week. And actually, Joey, I'm going to let you do this shout out. Yeah. Yeah, this Patreon shout out is for Tyler Gosden, who, by the way, helped with that Elder Dragon Zoolander joke. So Tyler in our Discord usually goes by Sunny. Thank you so much for supporting the show. We really appreciate it. And your quips are really, really funny. Thank you for letting me steal some of your pitched intro jokes. It's really awesome. OK, fellas, let's get into our main topic now. We are talking about the best new precons going from 2020 forward. And there are eight different sets for us to cover here. So I think we're just going to dive right in. Dana, do you want to tell us a little bit about Commander 2020, what was going on there? And then we'll start to feel, you know, we'll start to talk about how we feel about it. what was going on with that precon set. How do we feel about it today? So Commander 2020 started us off with five different three color decks. Um, they were wedge colors, which is a, a pair of colors and one enemy color to, to that pair. So we had a Jeskai cycling deck, a Sultai mutate deck a Teamer Instant deck, a Mardu Humans Tribal deck, and an Abzan kind of keyword counter deck. And these decks all had very notable and interesting face commanders. Uh, you had Kalamax, uh, the commander that copies the first instant spell you cast each turn. Um, really, really useful ability and does give you multiple different ways to play it, as well as it goes infinite and <laughs> very, very easily. That's true. You had Gavi Nest Warden. Um, whenever you draw your second card each turn, you make a dinosaur cat creature token and it reduces the cost of the uh, first spell you cycle each turn. So there was a lot that people were able to do with that. Cathril was the commander that basically let you do everything with the keywords that were available and out there. Multiple different like types of keyword counters you can put on creatures. So that opened up a lot of space, particularly in colors that didn't really do that kind of thing before. So it gave people an interesting thing to do in those Obzan decks. Uh, Otrimi, 
just is one more way to kind of do fun mutate stuff. And we hadn't ever had a human tribal deck in, in that color combination either. That was particularly Selesnia generally in the past. So being able to do Mardu humans with Jarena Kudro was relatively new design space. So all five of those commanders gave people a way to do something interesting in a color grouping that hadn't really done those things before. Importantly, I think it's fun to notice that Zaxara, the exemplary, which is the Hydra makes mana commander, is actually the most popular commander from this pre-con set, which is pretty interesting, with Calamax and Gavi right behind it. So one of the secondary commanders actually pulled ahead of the rest of the pack here. So there certainly were a whole bunch of things to play around with just in the command zone, but then there were also some pretty spicy cards that showed up in the 99 of these decks as well. We got some crazy new cards here. Yeah, I mean, it turns out if you print free spells, folks are going to want to play them. Uh, and that's just what this this set did. Um, you had stuff like Fierce Guardianship, which was a uh, basically a free negate. You're able to counter uh, target non-creature spell as long as you control your commander. But there were a whole cycle of these. There were free spells that you were able to cast for free as long as you had a commander in play. And these, all of them are turned into being fairly powerful cards, whether uh, it was deflecting SWAT, a good way to kind of redirect a spell, um, or you just want to save your board, or Deadly Rock, you want to blow some stuff up. All of these were just great. Um, Fierce Guardianship turns out to be the most popular because free counter spells mm -hmm. rarely are not bad. Um, <laughs> but so over 68,000 decks are finding homes for Fierce Guardianship. That kind of shows you how powerful and desirable these effects are. Um, but the def deflecting SWAT almost is in 52,000 by itself, which is also a, a very, very respectable number. Yeah, and even beyond those, there were some other interesting cards. I like Species Specialist from this set, which let you draw cards whenever creatures of a chosen type die, which has been really useful in my recent zombie deck, which I think we'll get to a little bit later. Um, there's also like the card Twinning Staff came from this set, and Twinning Staff has been a lot more interesting with the newer cards that are copying creature spells that we're seeing in recent times as well. So there are definitely some hidden gems in addition to the really big standouts like Fierce Guardianship. Dana, were there any reprints that caught your eye from this pre-con set at all? Um, you know, Skull Clamp is always useful. There's really never a situation where it's not nice to get one of those because it's also perpetually a several dollar card. We got a copy of Atali Primal Storm. Um, so I think we needed like a, a 12th different printing of that, I think for sure. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a good card. I, I'm, I'm kind of poking fun at it. it it's an excellent card, I should say. It's not even just good. It's, it's fantastic. It also shows up every single year. It's one of those reprints where mm. it's just always going to show up in decks. So, But the Locust God, on the other hand, was a card that had gotten up there in price a little bit. And that was nice to see that get reprinted. It's really good in that particular deck that it was in. And it very much needed to come down in price. So that was a really good one, I thought. Yeah, I mean, Shared Animosity also is never a bad card to reprint, especially when you have some tribal hev heavy synergies. Mm. It's just such a great card. And like, I remember originally when um, the Ed the original Edgar Markov, the uh, Mardu Vampires deck was printed, Shared Animosity got pretty pricey pretty quick because people realized like, holy cow, this, this card is wildly powerful. Uh, <laughs> so having a, a, a reprint in a pre-constructed deck like it had here, also was very, very welcome. I think also this was a time when the reprinting of Arcane Signet was a bit novel, like it had only been in the Brawl precons, and this printing of Arcane Signet started to make it actually a bit more accessible, and we've seen it more routinely in precons since that point, but I believe this was also a very important moment for Arcane Signet to get a reprint. So now that we've covered some of the new cards, some of the commanders from this set, you know, we've gone over all of that, let's actually kind of grade it. For example, Matt, was this a pre-con set that you find yourself enjoying? When you look back on it, are you happy about all of the crazy stuff that it did? Or is this one that maybe, I don't know, thumbs up or thumbs down? What are you thinking about C20? Um, I wasn't ever... Dude, exactly. Yeah. There's so much in that silence right there, there and that's exactly how I feel too. <laughs> very, very weighted silence. I want to give it a thumbs up because I like some of the new things they did. Um, the face commanders, ne they never really did it for me. It's not that they weren't popular, just me personally, I didn't latch onto them. Um, I want to like find a way to like cook the rankings to give it like a two out of three. I don't think it should be unanimous <laughs> either way, but like I'd give it a thumbs up because there was some cool stuff. Um, I liked Call the Copper Coats. That card is just super, oh, yeah. super fun. Um, but overall, like I struggle. So like a, a hesitant thumbs up. All right, Dana, how about you? Um, I think I think it's kind of a tough set to rate a little bit because there was so many times I would see an Amazon deal or be walking through a Target and be like, oh. Well, there's a fierce guardianship that comes with 99 free cards. <laughs> um, 
Yeah. And to a, to a degree, that was true of a lot of those free spells. Even deflecting flats, excuse me, deflecting SWAT is getting up there in price. So we kind of had a similar thing. It's kind of tough to get mad at a set that, like, price wise, you were able to basically get 99 free cards with it. I mean, I, I always appreciate the, hey, I always need more soul rings. Um, Dang. But those five spells were so warping that it kind of makes it difficult to evaluate the rest of the set. I think all the commanders are relatively interesting and powerful. I think they did a really nice job there. Even the ones that aren't face commanders um, tend to feel like they're really well designed. I enjoyed that. Um, but the free spells are just so warping that I think that that really makes it tough to evaluate. For me, I will. The, the free spells do color a lot of my impressions here. I would give this set a thumbs down, despite it still being like a good deal and the commanders being very popular. Like I'm, I'm not at all trying to say that I think this was an unappealing set. It is just for me. I'm just like there were choices here that I think they needed to hammer out, and there was a lot of. Uh, in inelegant um, stuff going on here, such as those uh, free spells. Or this was also the set that, like, you know, we talked about some good stuff, but this was also the set where Cartographer's Hawk was sort of introduced as they like, hey, we're solving White's rant problem. And I'm like, no, I don't think that really works, actually. <laughs> so, like, that also kind of uh, colors my impression of it a bit here. The themes really didn't appeal to me, and the, uh, the, the, the guardianships, I am happy to see that things have moved slightly away from that type of direction in future precons. So, this one, especially over time comparing it to the precons that we're about to get to does get a, more of a thumbs down from yeah. me but that is also one of the only thumbs down i'm going to be giving in this video spoiler alert i mean dana is absolutely right like four of the most popular cards are actually the top four cards i should say from this set the new cards that were introduced are all the free spells like that's yeah. absolutely <laughs> yeah. warping the, um i mean fierce guardianship down to flawless maneuver one two three four um I do like, I did enjoy that the partner with mechanic was introduced here um, yeah, yeah. because I, I thought that was a much- Well, not introduced. It was just returned, returned to, to it, I think. Excuse me. Um, I like that they kind of kept working on fixing partner because the original execution partner, we've said many times, we weren't a big fan of. So just continue with partner with, I really enjoyed. Um, I have a new Keeman Kazer deck myself. Um, so I really enjoy that. So I, I like- I just, the, the face commanders, they're just terribly unexciting to me. Yeah, certainly different strokes. But hey, that's why we've got so many other precons to go through. So let's move on to our next one. Now we're talking about Zendikar Rising. And to my recollection, this is the first time that they actually tied the precon sets to the set's release. So these were like, I guess, quote, the mini precons. Dana, were these selling? Like, these were the ones that were like around 20 or 20 bucks when they first came out. Is that right? They were relatively cheap to pick up. And they were a replacement for the quote-unquote bad Planeswalker decks that we would get where it would have <laughs> a, a face Planeswalker card that would be one of the ones from a set, but it would be one that was supposed to not be standard playable. I mean, it was standard illegal, right. but it was, they were supposed to be not good enough for standard. Um, and the problem with those products, I guess, such as it is, is they almost never contained anything that was potentially usable for Commander players. Um, it felt like a very, very narrow market they were trying to sell those to. And I always, mm. it always felt like a wasted opportunity to me. Um, prior to that, they would kind of use that something versus something deck, heroes versus monsters, speed versus cunning, whatever, in that slot as well. Um, at least those tended to have reprints on occasion that were useful, but the Planeswalker <laughs> decks very much seem to be going towards an audience that I didn't know if it existed or not. Um, whereas now then the switch to these decks not only gave us multiple new face commanders that you could potentially use in commander, it was a place to put reprints as well and get more copies of Arcane Signet out there and more copies of that Soul Ring, which is, you know, it seems silly to say, but it's always a $3 card. Like it's just always nice yeah. to get more copies. So this I thought was a really nice switch. It gave us more chances for lore characters. It gave us more chances for reprints, more new commanders. Just on the whole, I think, I love the fact that they moved this direction. I think it was great for Commander and it was really good for Magic. Yeah. Yeah. Also, spoiler alert, another thumbs up is coming here. This is the set that had Anawan the Ruin Thief and Obun Muldaya Ancestor and the Rogues and the Landfall perfectly lined up with the set. Like, oh man, this is this is this is good stuff. Yeah, I like that they took kind of took pressure off themselves with these the pre-constructed decks that accompany the sets like these two. Uh, they took pressure off 
you know, throwing all these new cards out. They only put, you know, a few new ones in each deck, mm. which is totally fine. Like, Geode Rager is an absolute sweet card. Mm -hmm. I love it. Like, the more that I've played it, the more that I've come to enjoy Geode Rager. Oh, yeah. Um, but so they're throwing a few new cards in, but, like, they're mainly focusing on just how can we make sure that reprints are getting out there. Um, Kadama's Reach was in the Landfall deck, and that's still a $2 card because everybody needs a Kodama's Reach if you're playing green. Um, there's just a bunch of really solid cards they're finding places for, finding a reprint space, and it's just, it's never a bad thing to have these things just as, you know, you're, you're just getting into the format, you don't have a ton of money, 20 bucks, you have a pre-con that's ready to go, and it's fairly well functional outside the, you know, out of the box, which is one thing I think Watsi should be commended for. Just over the past couple of years, they've really gotten into a good uh, kind of flow with making sure that the pre-cons work well out of the box. At that price point too, it also makes for a relatively painless impulse purchase. Like <laughs> at, at the $40 mark or something, when there's five of them coming out, okay, maybe once a year, you, you don't feel too bad about it. But like for these, um, if these were the full price commander decks, it would be something that I think would be kind of tough for me to rationalize spending money on. At $20, it makes it very easy to be like, oh, that's a fun commander. And rather than buy the single, I'll just buy the whole deck. Like it, it, it makes for a really good entry point, both for a veteran player who might not have otherwise bought it and for a new player who's thinking about it. Like it's much easier to spend that 20 some dollars and get a deck you can play for a format you're not 100% sold on than it is if you're having to look at spending me 40 plus on the standard pre-con or even more if you're trying to build a deck from the ground up. Oh, goodness, yeah. And and also, like, it was a lot of the smaller reprints, Matt, like you mentioned, that kind of keep things in that smaller range, which is just nice, like more continued reprints on those. But then there was also, like, you know, uh, Omnath Locus of Rage was reprinted in this set, too. And I'm like, that's actually pretty darn good. Sir Conrad, I know he's just an uncommon, but any set that includes a Sir Conrad is going to capture Joey's heart. Like, y'all know it. Like, so I'm, I'm definitely a fan of these. The, some of the new cards were a little bit lackluster, like Whisper Steel, Stag Whisper Steel Dagger. I, I don't think that one's great. But some of the cards, Matt, like you mentioned, the Rager earlier, some of those are also just like, oh, man, another goad creature. Heck yeah. So, yeah, this was especially for its price point, really, really appreciated the way that this innovation occurred with the precon. So huge thumbs up from me. Yeah, same here. Thumbs up. I, I just I like these little things. They're not putting a bunch of pressure on making stuff super powerful. There's we need to get some some quality cards into new players hands. I think they're doing a great job. Yeah, same here. Like, mm -hmm. thumbs up in the abstract just for the concept, <laughs> let sure, alone, sure, you know, yeah. what's actually in the decks. Definite thumbs up once you actually saw them, saw the price point, whatever. So, yeah, I'm totally on board with these. Yeah, the abstract and the execution. That's a good yeah. point to, to keep in mind for sure. So then we move from the Zendikar Rising precons to the Commander Legends precons. Um, this is the set that contained the Simic Sea Monsters, led by AC Tyrant of Gyrus Straits, who currently has over 2,000 decks to its name. And we saw one of the most inventive, coolest innovations that has ever occurred, a Boros equipment deck. It had never been done before and has never been done since. This was led by Wyleth Soul of Steel, who does command about a thousand decks to its name. So this was the Commander Legends suite of precons, which I think were also a little bit closer to that 20-ish dollar uh, price point, if I'm recalling correctly. What do we think about these ones, you guys? I mean, I, I think if you want to deflect criticism away from printing another Boros equipment commander, one way to do it is to print another Tatiova, I guess. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> um, again, I, I like the concept of these decks. Um, and I, I guess to be fair, we talked about this being a good price point and entry point for new players. Um, I fairly recently at my shop played against a brand new player who was playing against that that AC Tyrant of Gyre Straits that are playing with that deck. Um, if you are a brand new player who doesn't know magic particularly well, that's a really good baby's first EDH deck. It, <laughs> it keeps your hand full. It's, it's interactive. It's a lot of fun. Um, it's powerful out of the box. It's a really good deck for that kind of player. The problem is when anyone else gets a hold of it, <laughs> things kind of go pear shaped. Um, but I, I will say for, for your first deck, it, it's a good commander to play. I 100% I agree. Um, all of Dana's kind of comments on on the Zendikar Rising precons might apply here. Um, I think that in the abstract, they're great. It's just a continuation of what we already did. Uh, the specific execution maybe was a little overtuned. I think um, Wyleth is actually a very, very 
as far as Boros equipments go, granted it has been done a bunch of times. While this, while this is probably the, the best one of the bunch, I would say. Um, so yeah, I, I don't mind seeing it. Um, just the originality, I'm not, I wasn't terribly excited about. I have an AC Tyrant of Gary Straits deck. I've increased the CMC and it's just like, it's so easy to just, like you said, Dana, accidentally just oops into a full hand. It's just so powerful. Um, but the new cards, like they were, they were fairly cool. Um, I do think Blazing Sunsteel is, is a really rad card I have in my Valdeck deck. Um, and when it does some stuff, it does a lot of stuff. Blazing Sunsteel is the equipment that like gives you a stuffy doll-esque effect yes. on the equipped creature. Yep. So if it gets dealt damage, you deal damage back. That one's neat. I also, Timely Ward was a cool one. A Flash Indestructible Aura. But then there was also, like, this is the set that I'm pretty sure gave us Stump Squall Hydra, which is one of the worst rares I've ever seen in my life. Like, it, it's just kind of a Hydra that maybe lets you put some plus one counters somewhere and not even like a good amount of plus one counters. Like, it's just, it's, it's, it's not very good. And granted, we don't need a bunch more busted green rares, but it's still like, it is a head scratcher of a card, that one. I this one is a, a, it might be the only other one that I give a thumbs down we'll we'll see in the in the future but man this one is a, a a tremendous thumbs down from me including in the abstract because I don't think that the set commander legends which contained over like a hundred new legendary creatures I don't feel that it needed to have additional legendary precons necessarily or that like these even tied into the theme of commander legends very well the AC we did not need another Tatiova we just didn't need that that is not a thing we, that we didn't need you one look at Tati well, open like, hmm. <laughs> right. <laughs> Right. And the deck itself is sort of circumscribed by being sea monsters, but the commander wants to be landfall. Like it's very, I, this one's, mm -hmm. this, this, this one, not necessarily a fan. Yeah, I, I do agree. If my, my one big criticism is like commander legends already was such a juiced set for commander players. I don't know if they really needed to have these, especially the, the specific commanders they did. Uh, I still won't argue with something that's just a super accessible thing for newer players, though. The, the Boros deck contained more instants than equipment. I just, I, I don't like, that's weird, I, right? I said, I, I like the idea of them. I like them in the abstract <laughs> in principle. The specific ex, like, execution, I, I do agree. It, there, there was a little little lacking on this, this specific set. It, it feels a bit like they had decided to do the decks for the standard sets like Zendikar Rising. And at the last minute, like, we probably should have Commander decks for the Commander Legend set, too, because the last one sold so well. They feel very dashed off to me, um, mm. both in terms of the face commanders being, you know, not particularly interesting, or in the case of AC, just being an existing card, basically. Um, <laughs> and, and things like... How do you really feel, Dana? Yeah, How and, do you and, really and feel? things like there being more instance and equipment in the equipment deck... Um, it, it, it just, I, I wonder if this wasn't just a last minute decision and they just couldn't devote the time or resources to it that they had with the previous deck. So, um, it very much feels that way, at least. And it, it, that's, that's just going to happen sometimes. I, I tend to kind of feel a little bit thumbs down on this one as well, Joey, but I wonder if there is an excuse for it. Yeah, Dana, I, I completely agree. There are some interesting things going on with this precon set. So with that evaluation done, I think it's time we move on to our next precon set, which came from the Kaldheim set. Kaldheim Commander introduced us to Golgari Elves with Lateral Blade of the Elves, which makes a bunch of elves and also can tap a bunch of your elves to make your opponents lose a bunch of life, too. And right off the bat, Cathril has become one of the top 20 most popular commanders. Like, that thing climbed up the ranks. It's currently rank 17 with 4,700 decks to its name. So that's going to color some of the uh, evaluation here real quick. And there was the Azorius Fortel deck with Ranar the Ever Watchful, which could help you out with Fortel costs and would make you spirits whenever some of your stuff went into exile. And that one proved to be decently popular as well. But these two decks came out to us in the Kaldheim Commander deck. A couple of new cards of note too, like Cosmic Intervention or Dana, there is Pact of the Serpent, which lets you draw extra cards and lose life based on the a tribal deck. Like I'm sure that you've got to be really happy about losing life and drawing a bunch of cards and say another copy of minions murmurs which i'm a fan of so yeah definitely i'm a fan of pack of the serpent for sure yeah there were just some neat cards in here some of those cool foretell effects or wolverine riders is a six mana elf that makes a bunch of other six mana elves and matt i'm sure that a six mana creature that makes a bunch of other creatures is one of those things that appeals to you too so i feel like this is hitting a lot of marks i do like big dopey creatures so yeah this is absolutely a, a plus for me um it was cool just to see like 
how they're exploring some of the specific sets or not sets, but themes from the sets that they're accompanying. Mm -hmm. um, I know that, that Gavin Verhey has said on Twitter multiple times, like we want to have com some commander decks for like some of the cool themes that we, we might see. And so having a, a commander that's going to support a foretell type of deck, you know, if you really like that mechanic, you actually have a commander this time to do that. And elves is, elves is always a very, very popular tribe. It's up there with zombies as far as one of the most popular of all time. Mm -hmm. So having a, a, you know, multicolor, you know, we don't have too many elf specific tribes or commanders, I should say, um, in Golgari colors. So having that around probably was very appreciated as well. Yeah, and I'm gonna quick come back to the Commander Legends two precons again and how kind of unfinished those felt to me because these two decks don't feel that way at all. Yeah. We have two two very interesting commanders in decks that feel very much built around what they're doing. I, I just think we're, we're again looking at a situation where a lot of time and thought was put into these and there just probably wasn't as much that was allowed to be allotted to those two previous decks we talked about a few minutes ago. These feel very cohesive. They feel very well designed. The commanders feel appealing. An all-around excellent product that they did a really good job with, both in terms of face cards and new cards. I, I liked them a lot. And, and honestly, even the reprints do impress yeah. me here. It contains, you know, it sounds simple to say, like, oh, the elf deck had stuff like Elvish Archdruid, which is an elf that gives you a bunch of money. But, like, that is important to make sure that, like, if the deck had not contained that card, that card would have shot up in price. And there's a bunch of little examples of that going on in the ways that this, these these two decks are constructed. And I'm just really a fan of that. Even little reprints like Beast Within can, or, or Ghostly Prison was also another reprint from this deck. And those can make a big difference when they get perpetual reprints over the course of the year. So I'm happy with the reprints. Prints, I'm happy with the new cards, especially because the new cards don't feel universal. They don't feel ubiquitous, like, you know, there's no reason not to play this or anything like that. Like, these actually feel like decks where you have to have a good reason to use them. They feel niche enough that it's appropriate. Like, this feels like the correct place where these cards should have been printed, and it doesn't feel like I absolutely need them to get by or anything like that. Like, they just, they feel like cool new cards that I'm glad to see exist, and I'm not, like, overwhelmed by in any case. I, I like how proactive some of these reprints have gotten, like Beast Whisperer, um, making sure that card mm. never really gets above $5. Like, yes, it's, it's not a cheap card necessarily by every single budget, but like making sure that's always within reach of a majority of players. I love keeping cards like Beast Whisperer, which is in, in that range of it's never going to get to that $10, $15 mark. Like we're going to make sure we get ahead of that on reprints because we know that effect is so desirable or having wood elves as a dollar at all times. <laughs> that's another card that I, I really like having just accessible for as many players as possible because it's just such a quality staple card. And then putting stuff like, I don't know, some some five mana rasp with upside, you know, your cleansing novas or your, your casualty of war type cards too, making sure those are always something that, that every single player can have access to. I just, I love keeping those within reach. Yeah, this this one, uh, I, I don't know. I'm not going to do like a, all right, guys, on three, what do we think? But like, it does feel like we all have a big thumbs up going on here. Is that the correct, my, getting the temperature in the room correct? <laughs> Absolutely. Yep, yep. <laughs> yeah. This is this is this is a happy product. Definitely a happy one here. So really, really cool stuff. Yeah, like, and this is especially where it starts to feel like the precons are really getting into a certain groove for them and. The next set of precons that we have to discuss is especially where the precon groove feels like it is just, uh, it, it, it's going to be an absolute treat, which is why we're going to wait until we're done with Challenge the Stats before we actually get to it. That's right, we're pausing real quick. We are talking about Challenge the Stats, one of our favorite segments here on the show. There is so much data on EDHREC, but you know, we don't always agree with it. Sometimes we think that cards see too much play or too little play, so every episode we like to challenge those statistics. And don't forget, if you want to support Challenge the Stats, you can do so by going over to Alter Sleeves dot com slash edh retcast alter sleeves is the official sponsor of challenge of stats where you can get some amazing perfect fit art that's just printed straight on the sleeve instead of somebody marking up on your actual cards say you have an underground sea like dana and you're just buying wins um, you want to protect that card but you also want to extend the borders out you can do so with an alter sleeve get some awesome extended art you can get our handsome faces onto some of your Reclamation Sages or your Sir Conrads or your, your Reliquary Towers that turn into Leaning Towers of the Dana. Um, <laughs> Altersleeves.com slash EDH Retcast to support the show and get yourself some pretty sweet sleeves. Awesome stuff. Dana, how about you start us off this week? What is your challenge? Um, my challenge is a card that's in just 99 decks on EDH Rec. And okay. 
I, I was I was helping a friend out with um, their rogue tribal deck as they were complaining about the challenges they had dealing with flyers. So um, I was doing some searching and I'm like, well, what? OK, what can we come up with a first solution to kind of give you some defense against flying attackers? Um, the card Mystic Decree from back in Homelands. It's two blue blue and it says all creatures lose flying and island walk. Um, it's on the reserve list, but it's still only around two dollars right now, so you can get in relatively cheaply on it. Um, but I do think this card has some some utility, despite being from Homelands, where it feels like nothing has much utility. Um, a relatively famously bad set in Magic's history, um, but there is some use for that, despite blue being a color combination with many things that tends to have a lot of flyers. Um, there are things in blue. There's things like Feldegriff or Tibor and Lumia that can give your stuff flying after the fact. So you have commanders where you can play this, knock everyone else's flyers down, and then use the activated ability or triggered ability on Tibor and Lumia's case to then give your stuff flying afterwards and go over the top of everybody else. So... It's not the kind of card I think you want to run in a ton of decks unless you have a really, really good reason. But I think there are blue decks where you don't have flying and you can't deal with flyers. So it's a way to kind of defensively stop those things from hitting you or at least stop them from going over the top of your stuff. And there's decks where you can kind of make that one sided and shut down the flyers, but still give your stuff flying to go over the top when you swing back. So, um, Mystic Decree for a relatively cheap card. Uh, can solve some problems in blue. And if you're one of those people having those problems, it's a pretty decent solution. Dana, that was surreal. Um, <laughs> that was... <laughs> and it's an enchant world, so you can blow up somebody else's concordant crossroads with it. Oh, okay. Uh, so it's a I removal don't... <laughs> spell too, Joey. <laughs> we're, we're, this is always going up on Dana to find the oldest <laughs> and least played cards ever to challenge. <laughs> From the worst set, yeah. yeah. Okay, man. I'm going to move on to my challenge here. I have the listener submitted challenge for this week. And this comes from Twitter user at Mr. Behave, who wanted to challenge the card Tree of Redemption in Willow Dusk Essence Seer decks. Willow Dusk is a really interesting Golgari life gain and life loss commander. Willow Dusk can tap for one mana and tap itself to choose another creature of yours and you put a bunch of plus one counters on and equal to the amount of life that you've gained this turn or life that you've lost this turn, whichever amount is greater. And you can only do that at sorcery speed. The reason that Mr. Behave wants to challenge the card Tree of Redemption in this deck, Tree of Redemption being that four mana zero 13 with Defender that can exchange your life total with its toughness, they want to challenge that because life exchange, according to the rules of magic, actually counts as life loss and life gain. So you can do some really crazy stuff if you are using Tree of Redemption's ability to switch your life total to 13, which counts as a huge life loss that Willow Dusk can then use to put a bazillion counters onto something, possibly even the Tree of Redemption, so that if you untap it and then use its effect again later, your life is going in a whole bunch of crazy directions. There are some very fascinating things that you can do with this type of interaction, so pay attention to the fact that life exchanges also count as life gain and as life loss, and will even be affected by things like Alhamarat's archive as a result. So this is a very fascinating challenge. Thank you so much for submitting it. Definitely take a look at this one if you are playing Willow Dusk. Well, I'm going to jump into and we'll, we'll wrap this up. Uh, I'm going to go on to my challenge. So we're talking about pre-cons and one pre-constructed deck that I think I'm not really sure what I think of the direction that it's taking. Um, Millicent Restless Revenant is one of the new um, spirit tribal commanders. It's, boy, it's all over the place. I know it hasn't been out too long, so we haven't gotten a ton of data, but early early signs, man, people are taking, whether it's tokens matter, whether it's flying matters, whether it's spirits. I, I don't know what people are trying to do. There's, there's several different anthems that are going on, and I think folks really want to kind of focus in on one. So one anthem that I think folks really are going to want to be looking at is Long Forgotten Gohei. Um, that card is back from the original Kamigawa block. Um, I know we're going back there, so I doubt we see this, but three mana for an artifact that says arcane spells you cast cost one less to cast. That's fine, whatever. Um, but also spirit creatures you control get plus one plus one. Um, I think this is going to affect all of your creatures that you end up playing in the deck, whether they're tokens or not. Um, 
Yeah, and it's only being played in 13% of decks so far. Um, kind of along the same lines, Rally of the Ranks is only being played in 19%. That's a newer card from Call Time, but it just as Rally of the Ranks enters the battlefield, you choose a creature type, and then creatures you control of the chosen type get plus one, plus one. So Millicent players are already playing stuff like Intangible Virtue, uh, which shows up on the page, but it only benefits your tokens, where you're, you, the average deck is playing 33 creatures in the deck, so you want to make sure that all of those creatures are getting the buffs. So stuff like Intangible Virtue, I don't think you want to be playing I think you want to make sure you're hitting all of your creatures. So stuff like Rally the Ranks and the uh, the Long Forgotten Gohei, those are both cards I think you want to be looking at more if you're trying to buff up your entire team. Not that your tokens aren't probably going to be plentiful because you're probably going to be making a lot of tokens with Millicent, but you want to make sure that both your tokens and your non-tokens are getting buffed up. So I would say definitely take a look at both of these cards instead of the more narrow Anthem effects. Matt, I love that the challenge that you and I both picked for this episode w kind of spoils some of the pre-cons that we're going to be discussing in the second half of the that, show. That's fine. We're, a, we're, we're just giving people bonus content. No, we just, there was a psychic link between us that we we, we we kind of like both decided upon doing that. So I think that that's very, very, uh, very fun. Dana, why weren't you on the same page as us? Why did you have to challenge a Homelands card? <laughs> <laughs> Come I, on. You know, I can't resist the siren song of a card with 99 decks. That's, that's <laughs> true. Can't. All right, let's get back into our main topic now. We are talking about the best new precons from 2020 forward. And now, now guys, now we're on to the big one. Now we're talking about Commander 2021. I hinted at it earlier when I was talking about Willow Dusk. This is the set that contains Lorehold, Artifacts, Prismari, Magecraft, Silver Quill Politics, Quandrix Tokens, and Witherbloom Life Gain. Osgear the Reconstructor, Adrix and Nev Twincasters, Zaphi Thunder, Conductor slash Collector, Willow Dusk, and Brina the Demagogue. What a powerhouse of a set this one was. I'm, ooh, we could talk about this one for the entire rest of the show as far as I'm concerned. What a good pre-con set. Oh my. I, yeah, I, I'm just going to go out there and say this is probably, in my mind, the best pre-con set, uh, full stop. Like, they, they did such a good job exploring new spaces, like with the Boros artifacts, and kind of figuring out a good sweet spot for that, but also finding, you know, other ways for the different color combinations to really explore stuff they hadn't really done, maybe a little bit in, in you know, the is it colors, because is it people... I mean, is it even a real color combination? Oh. But here, neither here nor there. But even like the Orzov, or excuse me, the Silver Quill folk, mm -hmm. uh, they were able to kind of find some politic ways and, and just different directions and executions that they hadn't really done before. Uh, yeah, um, the previous year's Commander decks with um, Akoria were part of Akoria. They, they all took place in Akoria, but like, for the most part, they didn't necessarily feel like an extension of the story. I guess General Kudrow kind of did as a character a little bit and having some mutate stuff did. In this case, all five of these decks very much felt like they were a another chapter in the ongoing story of what Standards was telling us about Strixhaven. Um, it just felt a piece of that plane and that universe and that, that, that set we were in in a way we haven't had before. And I really genuinely liked that a lot. I liked having this set just be an extension of what we were seeing in Standard. That was really fun. It was very organic. It added a lot to the world. Um, it was just a home run in every front. And that's before we even get to the really, really good cards they printed here. Oh, goodness. The new cards. The new cards. Y'all, the new cards. Archaeomancer's map took us by storm. Joe, are you excited about the new cards? <laughs> Ink shield, Matt. Ink shield is the best fog. If you watch twitch.tv slash EDH retcast, um, you've seen some hefty ink shields been cast on that stream. Oh my God. It's so, so good. Cursed mirror, the three mana red mana rock that comes in as a copy of something with haste. If you want it to be uh, ink shield, I'm not sure if I mentioned that one. Promise of loyalty is a good wrath effect that also lets you keep other people's stuff around, but they can't hit you. So there's a political wrath, which isn't good everywhere, but it can be good in very specific places. And it's really good in those specific places. By the way, there's Ink Shield um, that they printed, which is like really excellent. I also just like Guardian Augmenter. Give your stuff hexproof for your commander. That's pretty good. Ink Shield was another one. Ink Shield, make the inklings with the fog. It's so good. Like, I just, oh man, this, the, the, the new cards were great and the reprints were good. Uh, but but Dana, Dana, did you know that Ink Shield was printed in this set? <laughs> I, I heard that. I, somebody somebody I told heard, me that, yeah. that that was a decent The Grapevine card. once told me. But yeah, th Joey, you're, you're absolutely right. Like this, this set was just bonkers. I, I love it. This was the set I, I, I feel like there's the most 
I don't know if, what the right word is, penetration maybe. Like, there's one card from this set, I feel like, in every one of my commander decks. Mm. And it's not just Arcane Signet situation where, like, one card on my deck because it's, it's Arcane Signet. Like, <laughs> you know, I have Arcane Mancer's Map in a few decks. I've got Ink Shield in um, the one black-white deck I play. I have Monologue Tax in one deck. I have Cursed Mirror in a couple decks. I have Surge to Victory. Oh I have Witch's Clinic. Like, this set just put a card or two cards in every one of my decks. And it wasn't because the cards were like crazy, powerful, busted, you know, things were like, or, or Arcane Signet where it was just that much better than everything else has termed in terms of mana rocks. They were just useful cards that happened to find ways to be good in a whole bunch of different places. Um, and so I found those places like this card's good in this deck. This one's good in that deck. It just, it wound up being a set where I just found a ton of pieces for all of my builds. And that was really fun. Yeah. That, no, almost no matter what type of deck you're playing, like you probably found something cool mm -hmm. from Commander 2021. Pest Infestation, I absolutely love. I mean, in some decks, it's just a better Reclamation Sage. And Reclamation Sage is a fairly powerful card, folks. Right, yeah. Uh, but there's all sorts of stuff. There. Like, if you want another copy of the original Akiri, Bronze Guardian does a really good impression. There are just, oh, yeah. top to bottom, there's so many just super cool cards. Joey, I know that you get excited about Ink Shield, <gasps> um, which may ha may or may not have been printed in the set. Um, <laughs> need to confirm that. But I'm not, I'm not just, positive. There, <laughs> there's just so much gas all over the place. Like, Lele Leela, the Blade Reforged, that's just a cool commander. Uh, it fits really well with the Atali that you probably got in the same commander pre-con deck because Atali's <laughs> been in every pre-con. <laughs> but yeah, there's just like, yeah. Joey, I, I do agree. There's just a bunch of very, very cool cards. Uh, no matter what the strategy is, there's a new card, there's a, a reprint, there's just so much cool stuff. I just, absolute home run, the best pre-con set they've done. Yeah, and, and I, I barely hinted at the reprints earlier, but just like Alhamaret's Archive got a reprint here. Azuri's Predation was creeping up to like $8 or something like that. Hellkite Tyrant got a reprint as well to steal all of those delicious artifacts. This feels like this. I, I think each of us have made one deck minimum out of the commanders that came out of this set. And Dana, like you mentioned, it really feels like there's stuff going into all of our decks here. Compared to, with all of the other precons that have come out, there have been some precon sets that we've just felt, yeah, you know, it doesn't. this one's not necessarily for me, and it's cool, we'll just pass it on, I don't need this one. But this one didn't feel like a precon set I needed, it felt like a precon set I really wanted all of them. Like, this, they just absolutely nailed it. I, ah, uh, hugest thumbs up I can possibly give to this set. I, ah, uh, I'm just in love. By the way, Ink Shield is in it. Um, I'm not sure if I mentioned that, but there's also an English there, there's a, that's really good. I mean, I was doing some digging for this <laughs> set, just doing notes for the show. Um, I didn't realize Witch's Clinic was in this set. And that card yeah. is super cool too. Like there, there's, so cool. there's so much from this entire set. Um, it was very, very easy to miss some very good cards. I, I guess if I, if I would offer one criticism, I do think the the amount of value we got in reprints is a little bit misleading. Um, Hellkite Tyrant was a very expensive card when this came out as was Thousand Year Elixir, but they hadn't been expensive cards for very long. They had just shot up in price, you know, several months prior to these decks coming out. Um, so at the point in time when these decks were built and those were included, they weren't expensive reprints. It just made it look like um, we they, they were being more generous with dollar value reprints than perhaps what was intended. Um, so I, th I think that skewed things a little bit, but like, that's a nitpick. I mean, like that grand scheme of things, we still got some pretty decent reprints. So um, I, I wanted to point that out, but it's not at all enough to make me criticize the set. I was, I'm happy with almost every facet of it. It sounds sure. like you're criticizing the set, Dana. I, I, just, I just need you to hush. <laughs> I'm well actually in the set, I guess. <laughs> well, and that's just like, if that's the nitpick that we're that we're giving, what a good nitpick to have right, compared to sure. Ikoria. My nitpick is that I severely dislike the mutate mechanic in its entirety. Like, those are very different worlds of, yes. of, of nits to pick. So, For sure. Yeah, this this one, we, we could probably spend the rest of the time of this episode just talking about Commander 2021, but we've got to move on. We are going to now move on to the next pre-con set, which had four Commander decks. This was Adventure in the Forgotten Realms. Notably, Ink Shield was not reprinted in this set. I just need to make sure that is clarified. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> um, Adventures in the Forgotten Realms gave us Rakdos Treasures, Gruul Dragons, Esper Dungeons, and Bont Voltron. So you had your Prosper Tomebounds, who's become incredibly popular in Rakdos, your Vrondus Rage of Ancients, Sephiris of the Hidden Ways to explore all of those dungeons in Esper, and Gallia the Kindler of Hope to do a bunch of equipment and aura stuff. 
Matt, what did you think about Adventures in the Forgotten Realms? Was it exciting for you? Was this a precon set that you loved as much as C21? Where are you at with this one? Uh, this one kind of goes back to the original Ikoria precon sets. This one just didn't excite me a whole lot. Uh, mm. I don't know. Like It was really hard for me to process it. I didn't even know that um, Galia, Kindler of Hope, was even like a real card until we started doing <laughs> show notes for this. It was, this set seemed very, I don't, forced is not the right word, but just none of the precons I felt like it was, and honestly it was kind of peak, here's five sets in three weeks, um, good luck. Fair. That was the feeling. That's... So a lot of this set for me just got so caught up in everything else going on. It was really hard to process and I just, I, 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 I don't think I've been able to maybe appreciate it. That might be a better way to put it. I, I think that's really fair. This is especially where we were starting to feel like, oh, there are so many products and in addition to all of the new products, like Strixhaven, we had just come off of like it introducing not only like 60 new commanders, but also a bunch of double-faced cards. So there was a lot to read. And then this was right on its heels. And then there was another set right on this one's heels. So I can see it really feeling like it got sort of swept up in all of that and easy to miss a bunch of the things that were happening here. So honestly, I, I, I can feel that. This one I am certainly appreciative of, but I can also agree that there's an element to it that it was a little bit like, ooh, if blinking, you might miss it. Well, it's also a core set, and that tends to historically all have always have been a little bit lower power. Um, so I guess it's not surprising that this felt a little bit lower power of a set when compared to Strixhaven right before it. Um, also, you know, it has the aspect of being the D&D set, and none of, none of the three of us are big D&D guys, so it's a little bit outside our wheelhouse in terms of the aesthetics and the lore as well. All of that said, I think it was a really nice product that, that for being their first attempt at something like this, they did a really good job. The power level is maybe a little bit lower, but there's still plenty of interesting cards that I've found homes for here. Um, yes, it's based on an IP that wasn't developed specifically for magic, but it blends in pretty seamlessly. Like there's really nothing about this D and D forgotten realms world that couldn't just be another magic plane. So as far as like everyone's introduction to doing this whole kind of, um, you know, different IP in the magic world, this was a pretty smooth transition, um, in basically every way. And, and they were pretty good decks. I, I, I like everything about this, even if, it's a product that wasn't necessarily targeting me. Yeah, I think that's a really fair way to put it. This did, like, there was a commander that I ended up building from this set too, Karazakar, the Eye Tyrant, which is Rakdos Goad. Like, I've been really loving the Rakdos Goad stuff that we've gotten recently. And some of the other new cards, like Grim Hireling, which gives you treasures if you hit a bunch of people, or Druid of uh, Purification, which is sort of a Reclamation Sage that also has additional benefits if you want to politic a little bit. Just a little bit. It's still just, like, really good value. Or Wand of Orcus makes a bunch of zombies that's a cool equipment so there are just these these little gems that i keep finding the more that i look over this set and that especially makes me very happy every time that i look over it yeah it was just it was for me it just it was very hard to process nine pre-constructed decks plus two full <laughs> sets within two months um i think that's that's yeah. the biggest fault that i have is just this was just peak overload for me um all these cards sound very cool and i'm sure once i actually got a chance to read them now that i know they exist um i will probably be more excited about it but yeah for for me like it, it's probably a thumbs down just because <gasps> it was so crammed into everything else that was going on um i i don't know if four decks is sustainable for these these types of things i think two percent is great but four plus coming off of the pre-cons from the set before with with Strixhaven, it's just so much. It, it does have sort of the competition. If it had been able to stand alone a little bit on its own, separated from other stuff, I think that that would allow more time for it to breathe. So I, I get that, but I don't know that I can give this one a thumbs down. The reprints alone, like Heroic Intervention we got back here, Utopia Sprawl had been climbing to like $11 at that point. Or Dana, I'm sure you were very happy to see a Nature's Lore reprint. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, again, one of those cards, it's perpetually a couple bucks in the best case scenario on this at least kept it from going up more even if it didn't knock the price down very much mm -hmm. yeah, lightning greaves phantasmal image there were just all of these little bits that i really appreciated so uh, th this one does get a thumbs up from me even if it was you know quite a bit crowded in this time o on its own i still want to be like you know what there wasn't an ink shield in it but it was it was still pretty darn fun <laughs> if if ink shield is the uh the the bar that we're setting that i th i think there's only one thumbs up you're giving for, for every set basically moving forward yeah <laughs> 
Well, I, I want to talk about a set. Um, granted, there was no Ink Shield, so I'm, I'm sorry, Joey. But oh. it did have Kyler, Sigardian Emissary, which is even better. <laughs> um, but Inist- we went back to Innistrad and had in- in- Innistrad Midnight Hunt, which also came with two precons. So you had the Demir Zombies, um, which eh, it's Will Helt. Who cares? Uh, no, nobody oh. I like plays Will Helt. So, oh, don't you. Oh, don't you dare. Oh, I'm don't teasing. you dare. I, I'm, I'm, I'm besmirching <laughs> Joey's uh, new favorite bay. But also there was a Slesney Humans uh, pre-constructed deck, um, which actually um, Lenore Autumn Sovereign was the face commander, um, but it turns out Kyler Sigardian Emissary is just such a better, better, so much better. Did I mention better? Uh, humans, humans commander. It's so good. It's like twice, twice as popular as Lenore, and and Kyler like gets just so many counters on it, and it buffs up all your humans, and it does seem to be the the bigger standout from among those. But but yeah, Demir zombies. Uh, if, if, if there isn't a Ning shield here, but that's okay because Will Hilt. I did not expect to love Will Hilt as much as I do, but he replaces your zombies with more zombies. How can you not love that? This is I I, I thought that I knew the the master art of necromancy really really well, but I I was missing. There was a zombie shaped hole in my necromancer heart and this deck filled it so well Mm -hmm. um it it did the the two decks are very self-contained i think they're relatively well built as well um the problem here would be that tribal decks tend to be maybe a little parasitic if you aren't playing that tribe so the zombie deck has a bunch of things that care about zombies and interact with zombies and if you aren't playing that deck maybe it didn't provide you with very many new cards for your lift or excuse me for your list same thing with the Celestia humans deck if you weren't playing humans in those colors you maybe didn't get anything that was helpful for your deck but i mean that's just the nature of the beast if they're going to make decks that are very specifically built to one theme then you're, you're just not going to probably get many new toys if you aren't also playing a deck in those colors on that theme. That's just kind of how it's going to work sometimes. So um, I wanted to note that, but it's not really a complaint because I think the decks themselves, the way they're built, are just really, really good. And they've been a lot of fun to play against when I've played um, against them. So I think it's just kind of the trade-off when you want to build decks like that. There's going to be less pieces that you're going to be able to pick up for your other decks um, unlike with, say, the Strixhaven sets from Commander 2021, where they were a little more open-ended and it gave the ability for me to find a ton of cards for my decks. These aren't quite that, but that's okay. Yeah, I, I think if I'm going to play the, the Dana and, well, actually, this these specific two <laughs> pre-cons, um, <laughs> if my, my complaints towards the, uh, the Ikoria pre-constructed decks apply here. They are so specific that if you're not trying to do something that is it within that strategy you probably just don't really care that much and that's fine there still were, were very interesting decks um i mean they just carry on with the these accompanying pre-cons that are going with everything they do some really really cool things yeah this and also like the construction of the decks felt correct here too like there there were exciting new cards like crowded crypt is one of my favorite new mana rocks and it doesn't feel like one of those mana rocks that you gotta play everywhere but it can slowly accumulate a nice big pump out of a bunch of zombies or something like that there were there were new zombie specific cards like cleaver scob which i love that thing makes more zombies matt you got to play with a bunch of cool new cards like heron blade elite or somber walled beast master makes a bunch of tokens that i bet that you're pretty happy about it doesn't go everywhere but it goes in the places that you want it to and it just feels nice it feels right and i felt like the reprints were also good game here rooftop storm if it had not been in this deck would have been a more expensive card zombie apocalypse if it hadn't been in this deck would have been a pain to like have to go get it feels like such an obvious card to be in here and thankfully it was we got a demir talisman in here and the talismans will just routinely keep trying to keep creep up on the price tags as well death baron another good zombie like and, and this is just my experience talking from the zombie deck that i love so much but i think that matt you were also pretty happy with the reprints and the construction of the Celestia Humans deck that you got too. Yeah, I don't know if the the value necessarily was there, but that's fine because the decks. I mean, they both are very very powerful. Um, Champion of Lamholt just plays perfectly into what Kyler's doing. Mm. Um, I don't know so much about Lenore, and so if we're, if we're going at you know based off of the face commanders, um, I think Lenore maybe is a little harder to gauge. Um, but once you make that switch over to Kyler, like it, it's absolutely such a fun and powerful deck um, just by putting a different card in the command zone that's already in the 99. Um, one thing that I do want to point out, in, in credit of the blue-black zombies that we did see, um, holy cow, like you'd think that zombie decks had so much 
just a crowded field when it comes to what commander you can be playing. There's still almost 2,400 Wilhelm decks already. <laughs> yeah. Like, there, there's so much creative capital. That, and I think that, you know, I kind of expressed that with um, the Adventures of the Forgotten Realms precons. I just, there was so much going on. I just, I couldn't devote any more attention to it. You'd think that Demir zombie players would feel that way, but no. Um, Wilhelm obviously is just very, very powerful and popular, and it didn't take very long for him to catch on at all. I think that is a huge point in the favor of this set for me, is that despite the fact that this is a completely inundated field, Demir Zombies, it, Demir Zombies had never appealed to me before this deck, and they created a commander that did appeal to me for Demir Zombies, despite the fact that there were, there were already like five or six other options to choose from in that exact field already. I think that's very impressive. I do kind of think that Lynor as a design is just kind of like, oh, that's kind of a thumbs down of design. There's not a lot of excitement going on there. But as you've already mentioned, Matt, the other secondary commander that was in that uh, precon just feels great. Wilhelt feels amazing. I have loved playing. Every time that I play this deck, I get the giggles of just like, oh my God, I can do what with this deck? Like, I just, this this one is a, a slam dunk thumbs up for me just because of Wilhelt alone. Even if there were other precons in this set, even if there had been like three others that were all a bit lackluster, Wilhelt is carrying my cold, dead necromancer heart along to a thumbs up all by itself so yeah i, I am uh neither i nor anyone in the audience is surprised that joey uh, was really going all in here on the zombie tribal list um completely not at all remotely surprising but it's Z zero it's shocked a, pikachus in the audience exactly <laughs> um but again I, like i get it it's a good commander and it's a good deck and i, I think there's probably a lot of people who aren't even necromancers like yourself who picked up this deck and found they really, really enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah. and I, I think a big point too is um, there's a difference between doing powerful things and broken things. Yeah. AC Tyrant of Gyre Straits is doing broken things, but these commanders here, they're, they're doing powerful things for sure, but it, it's never, I'm playing against these and most of the precons, I would say since AC, um, I've never felt like there was, I never stood a chance. I like that difference, Matt. Yeah. That's a really good point. Wilhelm feels really strong, but I feel like if I'm on my game, I can play against <laughs> that. Whereas I, AC, I think no matter what I do, I'm going to fall behind. That's a really good mm -hmm. comparison. Yeah, and I think these, these two decks here specifically, they hit a very, very good sweet spot, I would say, of they're doing powerful things, but they're not doing broken things. I, th this one's cool. And that was just the first of the Innistrad related precons that we got. We will finish up now with the latest precons from Crimson Vow. We've got Azoria Spirits and Rakdos Vampires. So Millicent the Restless Revenant, which Matt hinted at earlier in his challenge, the stats. So a new spirit tribal deck, which seems to be pretty darn aggressive. Lots of attacks in the air and things like that. And a new blood focused uh, Rakdos commander that has a whole bunch of vampire stuff going on and makes a bunch of those blood tokens. This one, I would love to know. It's a bit more recent, so we don't have like a ton of data on it necessarily. But Dana, we'll pass it to you. What is your impression about these precon sets? Do you like them as much as I like Wilhelt? No one likes anything as much as I like Wilhelt. That was a, a falsely asked question. But d do you like the new precons? <laughs> I, I, I think it's the other side of the same coin where it's they're two really well built decks with commanders that are something kind of different than what we've seen before. So it gives people a way to, a reason to build them. But because it's back on Innistrad, they're also very tribal focused decks and maybe they're offering us less cards for our non spirit, non vampire decks um, because so many of them are built to work specifically with vampires and spirits. So um, because the decks are so focused, there's, kind of a, a, a more narrow range of decks that want to use these cards. But I like these commanders and I like these decks as well. And even if it doesn't maybe give me any any new toys, I think as long as they keep printing a quality product like this, there's just going to be a lot of happy people out there. Yeah, absolutely. Like, they, yes, there are a little narrow. Maybe you're not specifically getting like three new cards. But tribal decks have always been one of the most popular types of things you can be taking in a commander deck. So supporting tribal decks and Innistrad always has had some some very strong tribal ties. Uh, so having four commander decks over two sets that are tribal focused, it's not surprising. I like it. I, I think it ties very well. Like I've been very impressed with the the two sets worth of precons, even though 
yes, maybe they are a little specific to tribal decks, but still, like like I said, they're they're extremely popular types of tribes. Yeah, I'm also kind of interested in some of the newer cards that we're getting from these sets. These do feel of the the different things that we've gotten. These ones feel especially narrow. Um, there's Olivia's Wrath, for example, is a vampire based board wipe. Um, Haunted Library is a spirit creating card that might break into other places, but it also might need you to care a bit about the tribe in order for it to pay off the most. Um, Predator's Howl is a cool card that might have good ubiquity to give all of your stuff menace and sort of pilfer some cards off the top of your, your opponent's libraries. But th there's just like a couple of other things going on here that do feel very tribal specific, like Midnight Arsonist needs you to have a bunch of vampires for this to really be good. But also, you know, it, it's... <laughs> I don't know. I haven't made up my mind about where these necessarily will land, but I'm glad that they're here and I'm glad that I don't feel like I absolutely need to have them or anything like that. They feel like they belong in the deck where they were created. And that's just always a good feeling. Well, that, that's like also a good point, Joey, is after the the absolute inundation with new cards this year, um, it was kind of nice having this end of the year where it's a bunch of tribal stuff. And I'm like, oh, there's just going to be less stuff in these two decks for me to care about since it's so tribal focused. And that's good because it gives me a chance to take a deep <laughs> breath. Like, like that is, I mean, I don't think that was probably the intent, but it did work out that way where I, uh, if I wanted to not go all in on these last two sets because my brain is a little bit worked out, you could do that because so many of the cards were a little more specific. You, you had to maybe pull less time in prepping for it and reading about it all. I'll also throw out there that I like that the new Rakdos commander focuses like a lot of the new command, uh, excuse me, a lot of the new creatures that we're getting in that deck tend to be on the higher end of the mana cost because the new Strephon Maurer Progenitor sort of cheats things into play and you want to have high mana costs that make it worth it cheating into play. And that is a good departure from the other things that we've seen with Edgar Markov, who has a whole bunch of tiny vampires. And it's nice that when they created a new vampire precon, it is moving into a different direction that doesn't feel like, you know, oh, well, these are all cards that Edgar is definitely going to want to use. Like, no, that they probably doesn't need all of those like new six drop type of vampires. And that's a nice distinction that makes the vampire bloodlines, I guess, actually feel properly separated from each other. Like they don't have too much. Uh, there's a reason to build this deck as opposed to a different type of vampire travel deck is basically what I'm saying. I don't know if I see as much innovation in the spirits deck necessarily. There's a lot of tapping stuff down and we have a bunch of flyers, which is some of the same fare that we've seen from Azorius over many, many years. But at the same time, the deck still looks like it's going to do uh, enough punching that by the time that I were to actually like make that nitpick, I'd probably be dead in the game already. So I, I'm not too bothered by it, but it does seem a little bit less creative compared to the direction where I'm just like, I really appreciate that small detail about the Strephon deck. Yeah, Millicent does do a lot of punch and kick to the face. Um, but but <laughs> kind of like what you hinted on a little bit, Joey, that I, I really like is none of these precon commanders lately s seem very solvable. Yeah. Like there's no like one specific way to build xyz even you know the, the kyler and the will health like we we love those decks but like there's no like one best way to be building these and that pattern like if you look back like they've done a really good job you know there, there's no edgar markov there's no okay you play every single one mana vampire you have and a perforos <laughs> yeah. like, there's none of that feel anymore um i like that there's open-ended there, there's no like we're gonna hold your hand while you start to build this outside of, once again, AC Tyrant of Gary Straits, where Simic holds the hand, not so much the design. But um, yeah, I, I, I really like that they're doing new things, but they're kind of letting you do the interpretation of what the commander wants to do. Yeah. So after going over all of those newer pre-con sets from 2020, I think we'll wrap up here with just... Dana, what is your general feeling about these? Are you pleased with the direction that the precons are going? I feel like we already know the answer to that because you've hinted at it before, but like, let's just get our final thoughts down on paper. I, I am. I, I think especially the fact that they've been very cohesive and, and coherent and, and playable decks out of the box has helped a lot. And I think releasing two decks in the slot of those bad Planeswalker decks um, is a really good use of their time and energy, too. Um, if you have that slot there and you're using it for something that really isn't <laughs> being bought by anybody, why not replace it with something that people will buy that can get reprints out there, that can get new commanders out there? So um, I, I, I've been a big fan of that and will continue to be moving forward as long as they keep taking advantage of these chances to put more cards out there for all of us to use. I like it. And Matt? Yeah, absolutely. Like I, I love these pre-cons. Uh, I think it's just... It's probably one of the, the better ideas. So whoever within Renton offices came up with the idea to do this um, and make the pre-cons a couple little things like this um, definitely needs a pat on the back and a high five. 
Yeah, I specifically remember in our episode about the cards that we're thankful for, you praised the direction that the precons have been going. 2021 felt like the year of the precon to you. Um, and I, I think we've really seen over the course of time, it's been honed down. One of the, you know, the only dislikes, the only thumbs down that I gave personally in this episode were from earlier on, like back in 2020. And I feel like things have really gotten streamlined to a point that feels like efficient and exciting and not treading upon too much of the same ground while also like paying respects in the way that it needs to. There are always little things that we can improve upon, you know, see better reprints here or, you know, figure out the MSRP of stuff like, oh, there's always plenty of that. But I'm overall, the trend when looked at, zoomed out and looking over time feels just absolutely terrific. And we'll finish off with one final question, which maybe it will have an obvious answer. But hey, Matt, what was your favorite precon set that we discussed in this episode? Oh, Strict, Strict Save and Far and Away okay. uh, was my favorite <laughs> set. But it, I mean... Tyler Humans does everything that I've ever wanted to do with a Magic deck. Uh, I get to play green white, and I get to go to the combat step. Like <laughs> the the, the Timmy in me I, loves that absolutely. I think I think that's fair. So you and I might have the same uh, response there, where our favorite precon set was Strixhaven, but our favorite precon deck was the ones in the Midnight Hunt. Mm -hmm. Me for Wilhelm and you for Lynor. So Dana, Mister Homelands, what about you? What was your favorite <laughs> precon set, and what was your favorite precon deck of the Autumn uh, Willow? Autumn Willow was his <laughs> favorite precon. <laughs> I, I am not going to deviate much. The Strixhaven one I thought was the best in every single way. It was the most coherent in terms of tying into the storyline. Um, it had the most interesting characters, I thought, in terms of the new cards that were built. There's just a lot of good cards in the set. It is very much the kind of platonic ideal of what you want from a pre-con set. Very nice. And individual deck? Um that I'm really not sure of because I, I, I've i played one or two of them, but I have not played a ton of these decks. I, um, from what I've played against, I would say it would probably be the Lathro Blade of the Elves deck. Um, it was really good out of the box, and the Golgari Elves just played much different than your kind of traditional Risa Redeem Celestia Elf deck. So that was nice to see an, an Elf deck that played different than other Elf decks I've played against. I love that. that. That's a, a great point. Yeah, there are so many. There's something for everyone here across all of these things. So this is a, a cool thing. This is a great topic to revisit with all of the newer precons that we've gotten. Um, who knows how long it will be until we have eight new precon sets to discuss. Probably, I don't know, based on set releases, probably like we'll get back to this in another uh, three or so. Another week yeah. and we'll have eight more precon sets to discuss. Happy Thanksgiving. Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what, you guys. What's your turkey stuffed with? Two more precon decks. <laughs> Goodness. Oh, <laughs> good man. All right, let's call this episode to a close officially. Fellas, if our listeners would like to get in touch with us, where is it that they can find you all? Matt? So you can find me on the Twitters at Mathemus55. That's M A T H I M U S 55. And don't forget, Wednesday evenings, we are streaming over at twitch.tv slash EDH Retcast, where Joey's casting this one card from Strixhaven Precons. Uh, I believe it's called Ink Shield, I think, maybe. Who knows? <laughs> um, but twitch.tv slash EDH Retcast. We have guests on every single week, and it's always a super fun time. So make sure you tune in. And Dana. You can find me on the Twitter birds at Dana Roach. I am writing articles for EDH Rec and for Commander's Herald. You can hear me on my other podcast, CMDR Central, and you can find all of us together at patreon.com slash EDH Recast. And I'm Joey Schultz. You can find me at Joseph M. Schultz on Twitter, and you can find the cast at EDH Recast on both Facebook and Twitter as well. Plus, if you've got a question for us, you can contact us at EDHRecast at gmail.com. Our thanks go out once again to the whole team at the Command Zone for handling the post-production work on the podcast, and we want to thank our sponsors, TCG Player and CardKingdom.com, and you can visit Altersleeves.com slash EDH Recast for cool, custom EDH Rec sleeves. Listeners, we'll be back at you next week with more data and insights, but until then, remember, EDH Rec your deck, before you wreck your deck.